thing, a little different. Caleb will play while I'm still preaching. <laughs> I've seen churches do that where their piano goes. I'm like, I don't know how the pastor pays attention while there's <laughs> music going the whole time. Now, we're looking at um, what God has called us to and who God, God has called us to be. And we're working through our name, Salt and Light, and we made our name an act. I mean, the eye of light is ignite the Holy Spirit the Holy Work, the Holy Spirit's work in others. Now, what's important about that we explain is we cannot ignite anything in any anyone. The idea is that we can encourage and support and walk with, be with. Um, it's going to be on you to have the Holy Spirit rise up. But we're going to be there to walk along with you. And the Holy Spirit is, of course, uh, the least known of the Trinity. People have seem to be able to explain who God is, who Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit, they tend to struggle a little more, and we're going to be looking at that today, um, that uh, the Holy Spirit and, and what he does. But we have to start with what God looks for in us, and God looks to have a relationship with us he, through his son, and, and that's where it comes together is we have this relationship, we understand this relationship, we actually, God works better in us, we hear him better, and we can walk with him better. And he goes to, ex- hey, actually he's gone to a great extent to show us how much he wants a relationship. I mean, besides Jesus coming here, and one of the reasons for his suffering is he knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to be, Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be stabbed in the back. He knows what it means to be lied to. He knows what it means when to have a friend turn on you. And he knows death. There's nothing that we can experience that he has not experienced as a man. And someone, well, you can say, well, he wasn't married. Well, yes, he is the bridegroom. We are the bride. He knows exactly what marriage is. And uh, I heard one speaker talk about how you're, if you're on earth, that's sort of getting you ready for marriage in heaven, what the bridegroom is like. But as the bridegroom, he knows what it's like to be cheated on. He knows all about this. So there's nothing we will go through that he has not personally experienced uh, with us. So he can relate to us. That's part of the relationship because I understand. The, I, I can empathize with you. you know, he could do it without coming here, but he, he did it to show us how much he wants a relationship with us. And if that's not enough, you know, he, he goes even further. In you know, John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. He'll make a home with us. The idea of what's, who lives in a home? A family lives in a home. Again, stressing the relationship part of it. And then he has in John 16, 7, but very truly I tell you, it is, it, is, it is for your good that I am going away. This is Jesus talking. Unless I go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus is like, the relationship doesn't end with me ascending. It's going to continue, and we're adding another element to it. You now have the Holy Spirit, who is with you and an advocate for you. And it goes on in, 14, in John 14, 26. He, Jesus told his disciples, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will bring us to remembrance what Jesus said. Now, there's a problem here. If you're not in God's word, how can you remember anything? We, to bring something up, we need to know his word. We have to be in his word so there's something to remember. And so the Holy Spirit, part of his job is, okay, not in relationship, I'm going to have you remember my father's words. He keeps pushing this relationship. And in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know what you are do you not know that you are God's temple and God, that God's spirit dwells within you? Which is like, oh yeah, okay. This is part of being God's temple. Now through the power of the Holy Spirit, believers are saved, filled, with, feel, filled, sealed, and sanctified. The Holy Spirit reveals God's thoughts, teaches, and guides believers into all truth, including knowledge of what is to come. The Holy Spirit also helps Christians in their weakness and intercedes for them. The Holy Spirit seems to be doing an, a, a lot to have a relationship with us. And so if he's doing all this, the question becomes, are we listening to him? Are we actually receptive to his leadings and his teachings and his guiding? Because he's there, and if we're not hearing, we're not moving, we may be the dormant one. 
not the Holy Spirit. So God has gone through all these factors to get our attention. And we have to ask if we are listening or not to him. Now, we are told in Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now, if we read again the first few words, we can change the first one if we went to you, well, you or we. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. God has given us responsibility to be the salt of the earth. You know, we can look at all the meanings of salt where it, it, it can give flavor, it can preserve, it stops decay. It does all these wonderful things. This, being the salt of the earth, I mean, we can show the world how to actually not to decay by this world, how to not have marriages decay, how to not have relationships decay. He says, you're the salt. It's an awesome thing he's put on us, but God's saying, but you can do it because I've given you the Holy Spirit who actually guides you and talks to you and leads you and reminds you of my Father's words. So I'm just not throwing you out there on your own. I have the advocate with you to walk with you, to help you, to guide you. And it, I mean, the, if you look at this, it's a, it's a bold statement. It can be, once it's a harsh statement because he said, what good are you? In Luke 14, 35, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's, neither, it's fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. It is useless. And God is saying, if you are not salt, what good are you? He did not design us to be ineffective. With the Holy Spirit, we are designed to be effective and make a difference. And God has put this bold statement out there saying, you are salt, and what good is if you lose that saltiness? What are you going to do? How is it going to be? And I was reminded of this this week, and since actually there's all different types of preachers and stuff, like Mike's more of a, um, teaching pastor, I'm more of a storyteller. That's why I always have illustrations and stuff. It's what I enjoy. So I decided the next half of the sermon is just going to be storytelling of God moving. When we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit will do. A few weeks ago, uh, Kristen's doing a lot of her, in her company and there's a lot of, she's trying to change new things in place, which makes for a difficult time, just when you're changing things and moving things. And it was getting really intense. And so she's sharing it with me one day, and I'm being hit pretty hard, like, I think I need to go with you on your next business trip. Now, in all the years Kristen has been in the business world, she travels regularly, I have never once been called to go on a business trip with her. The only reason I've gone on a business trip is to go see a place that I wanted to see. Uh, last year, she went to Colorado River, and I was like, I'm going to go there because there's mountains I want to climb. So I went with her to go climb mountains. So I've never been called to any of her stuff because of business. And it, I was being really convicted of it, and I was up one night just it was going over and over with this that I am supposed to go with her. And, and God's like, yeah, you're supposed to go. Now go to bed and go to sleep. And so I went to bed. I went to sleep. I slept well. But in my sleep, I had a dream. I'm on this business trip. I'll be outside. I didn't know if it was a restaurant or a cafe or a coffee place. And I was going to meet someone I have never met before, and God was going to tell me what to say. And this was very vivid to me. And so I, Kristen woke up, and I said, I, 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 I'm really supposed to go with you. And she had a restless night sleep, struggling with stuff, so I slept really well, but she was restless. And uh, she said, yeah, you are supposed to go with me to, on this business trip. I said, okay, we don't know when the next one is. I said, but it won't, can't work if it falls on the week that we have uh, life groups, because uh, one of us would need to be there. And all of a sudden she gets a call. We have an emergency meeting this last week. And she said, and she says, she's okay. And Kristen you know, bought tickets for me to go. You know, she gets them for her company. It was really nice because we got middle seats because you go at last minute. And there's nothing like being in a middle seat. Um, also, on the middle seat on the way back, I was, this, I was the small guy <laughs> in my row. 
and I'm not a small guy. Uh, so <laughs> it was uh, a you know, fun trip, but I'm like, okay, let's go there, and we fly out, and, and we get there, and it's, we get there Sunday night after s- service, we went, and Monday morning, she's down in a, a getting breakfast, I'm up in the, in the hotel room, and she texts me, and she says, we found one reason that you're here, I'll tell you when I get out stairs, and she comes up, she said, I just got a call from my boss, her boss uh, drove there the, uh, the night before, blew out his tire, now, he, ha- he doesn't have a spare because he has one of those tires that you're supposed to be drive on for 50 miles, except he ripped his tire apart. There was nothing left of his tire. And he, uh, he's up to 2 a.m. getting this thing taken care of. Well, Kristen, and he's like, can we do anything? And he said, my husband's here. God told him to be here. He's here to pick you up. And so I'm like, oh, great. So she tells me, you got to go pick up my boss. I said, great, I'll go get him. And I know him. I've met him. A c- we've talked a couple times, so I know him, and I know he's a he's a believer. And so I pick him up, and and uh, he he could not get an Uber. He could not get a Lyft. He could not get a taxi. Nothing was available. I was the only thing available. So, so I get him. I he gets in, and he looks at me. And says, "Okay, tell me this thing about hearing God tell you to come here. What does that sound like, and how is that done?" And so I just tell him. A, you know, God just puts something on your heart. You, you know, you're just trying to be sensitive to his leading. And he says, did you ever think you weren't supposed to come? I said, oh, yeah. On the drive to the airport, I said, I start, should I really be doing this? And he said, why do you think that happened? I said, oh, that's Satan. He likes you to start questioning what God tells you. I said, part of it, too, is Kristen was a little nervous because this trip, she works like 7 to 7, and she has a very set routine, and I'm about to throw that routine. And I'm like, at one point, I looked at Chris, and I said, should I be coming? And she's like, yeah, yeah. And took off in the plane. I got calmer and calmer, and when we landed, I was fine. But I realized I was sensing Kristen's tension the whole time. It wasn't just mine, it was hers. And by the time we landed, we were both fine, and Kristen looked at me and said, I'm glad you're here. And then so I'm telling him this, and he's like, wow. And he's like, he's, he's going through an ordeal with his family through medical issues. He's like, I don't know if I should be here or not. And he's wrestling some personal issues. And so I'm just able to speak into his life, encourage him, lift him up. So we're just driving, and I'm just lifting him up. You know, he's a smart guy, really nice man. And I'm like, this is great that I can encourage him and, and speak into his life a little and, and lift him up. And he said, well, what are you doing once you get to the, once I drop him off, I said, oh, I now have to pray for your meeting. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to stay here and pray. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I can't walk around the building because I know you have cameras everywhere. And if one of the uh, security guards is a Christian, he'll start seeing this guy and thinking, is he Joshua? And he's, he's, <laughs> he's going to make the walls fall down. So <laughs> but I'm like, I said, so I'm like, I'll do one loop around, and then just so happens right next to this company, there's this walking trail. I'm like, this is great. So I'll, I'll do my loop around, and then I'll be on the walk trail, and I'll pray. So I'm, I'm praying for them, and p- I get partway through my prayer. I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, this is really silly. I don't know really what to pray for. I, I'm like praying that meetings go well and stuff. I said, tell you what, you know what needs to be said here. You know what needs to be done. I really don't. I'm sort of guessing. So I tell you what, why don't you just take care of that meeting and I'll just spend the rest of my time worshiping you and spending time with you. And I have my phone, so I'm putting on Christian music. And it's really nice to be able to sing and stuff outside. And there's no one walking around. So they didn't think I was crazy. So I spent the time just worshiping God, putting up any prayer that was on my heart. But really, Lord, let your will be done here. And let, let you be seen and let you be heard and, at this meeting. And, and so I did that for a few hours. And, um, and then I, I was gone. And for the rest of the day, and uh, Kristen calls me, and she said, I'm having dinner with a person who works for me. Would you like to join us? I said, yeah, I'd love to join you. So I head over to this really nice place, and as I walk in, it's an, he picked the restaurant, the person she works with. It's an outdoor restaurant, like in my dream. <laughs> I'm like, holy cow, we're sitting outside. And I could picture the chair I was supposed to sit in, and I'm seated. They left the, this chair they said left for me 
was the chair I saw in my dream. I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And I don't know this guy. I've never met him. And so I sit down, and, and uh, I don't know if he's a believer. He looks like he's struggling with trying to figure the God thing out. And he talked to, to Kristen that, I just saw the Jesus Revolution. And so and Kristen shared a little bit about that. And then I sit down. We start with a conversation going one way. I said, you know what? I'm here for a reason, so let's just talk about God. So I just shifted the conversation to get more into about why God called me here, why I'm here, what I'm doing here. And at one point he said, wow, he said, the meeting we're having, I expected it to be very difficult and contentious. I was surprised how well it went. And I'm like, well, I, it seems like the prayers were helping. And so this guy who really doesn't know much about Jesus, I was able to share with him and talk with him. And I'm like, that's why I'm here. And so I'm there doing that, and then we fly back, and, and I think it was on we came back Wednesday, and on Thursday, her boss reaches out to Chris and says, they're supposed to have a meeting. He's like, I can't meet with you. I'll share why later. And so um, he, he, she ends up talking to her saying, I woke up on Thursday morning with this conviction that I was supposed to be back with, uh, with my loved one who's having medical issues. I needed to leave. And she, he's like, tell Jim thanks. I became sensitive to the movement of God and the Holy Spirit. And I needed to get back home. And so he left early to do that. And as we're going through this, I'm like, you know, Lord, when we're sensitive to you, it impacts other people. You know, at one point, he, when I was in the car with her, her, her boss, he said, you know, he, had a, he has a, also a uh, sister-in-law who went through a terrible uh, ordeal, brain hemorrhage thing, just awful. He said, and someone called me and said, you know what, I feel moved to come and stay with you and help you out for a day or two. He said, I told him, no, 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 not necessary. He said, I should have said yes. I'm like, yeah, you should have said yes. I said, they were being moved by God. He's like, I have to be more sensitive. So when he woke up Thursday, he's like, God's telling me to go. I need to go. And he said, tell Jim thanks. It's just... When we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we can move with the Holy Spirit. And then it impacts others in ways we didn't know. I didn't know this guy, who, this guy I had never met. I, God just told me I was going to meet someone I didn't know. And Kristen told me later on, oh, by the way, he likes you. I'm like, well, that's good. He's better than not liking me. Uh, <laughs> and, and I didn't know if it was going to be too much because I was trying to walk the line of you know, sharing with him God and what God's doing and, and actually not overwhelming and it was really neat that he was able to do this. And so we can either be receptive to the moving of the Holy Spirit or not. But something you have to realize is when the Holy Spirit calls, it's not convenient. And it's not easy. There's work involved. I had to, Chris and I had a plan for me to go out. I still had to do my church work. So I'm out there. Matter of fact, uh, Lloyd called me for some help, and he's like, I said, I'm in Missouri, but I'll be back this day. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, no, 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 don't be sorry. I said, I'm still working. It's, I said, it's okay, you called me. There's nothing wrong with that. You should have called me. I, I said, but I'm still working. Uh, I said, but I can line this up with you on this day. We, we'll be fine. It'll all be beautiful. So I'm having to do work for Missouri. Um, I'm having to redo my schedule to do all this stuff. And then and then Kristen has to put up with me because she has a set schedule she has to deal with when she's on these business trips. And so it's not always convenient. And it's not always easy. The point is, if he's going to call and we're going to say yes, we have to be ready to do something. It's not just, oh, that was great. Watch the stuff and then do nothing. Those are great ideas and then do nothing. I've had, uh, I remember my father was looking to plant a church and they kept meeting out planting. They got really excited about it. But when it actually came time to plant it, no one really wanted to do it. They loved talking about it. They loved discussing it. They loved planning, but no one actually wanted to do the work. And my father at one point realized, these people are never going to help me plant this church. They just want to talk. It's got to be done now. And when, so when the Holy Spirit's going to put something on our heart, there's a reason he's doing it. And there's a response he wants us to have. Well, we're going to have to go and do it. It, I mean, could the Holy Spirit do himself? Yes. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, I can pray from Georgia. 
He's like, yeah, but I need you in Missouri. I'm like, no one else available? <laughs> He's like, no, you're the one who's available to go to Missouri. I'm like, okay, let's go to Missouri. And it's just, God will move, but we have to be ready to do. And when we do, we get to see an, an incredible things happen. We get to see God on, uh, no, plan unfold. We, at times we get to see the impossible happen. At times we get to learn that he does talk to us. He does talk. I mean, when he gave me that dream and then it happened, I'm just like, this is so cool. He talks and it happens. And there's times where all of a sudden you think, no, because Satan's going to do his thing. Because Satan, the last thing Satan wants us to do is actually do what the Holy Spirit tells us to do. But we also need Christians to understand this because there's at times we think it's something from the Holy Spirit, which is not from the Holy Spirit. And we need that, others in our life, to help us with that walk, to figure it out. But we can be that encouragement, that light to others. So they'll get excited about it. I mean, I love 2 Timothy 1.7, which says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Because I tell you, you need all three of those things if you're going to respond to the Holy Spirit. Power, love, self-control. But because we have the Holy Spirit with us, there's your power element. You know, that's, that's power. And he's going to make things happen. And so we're called to this. And, and wonderful things happen. No, we have like Mark 9.50, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. And that's not just have peace with each other when everything's going smoothly. That's having peace with others when it's not going smoothly. And I really like Colossians 4.6 because I think this is so important. The Holy Spirit has got to be there. The salt has to be there. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so may, you may know how to answer everyone. Wow. Knowing how to answer people. I mean, we like to say stuff, but maybe it's not the right thing to say or we shouldn't speak or we should listen more. It's like, wow, Lord, we need, we really need that. Knowing how to answer. So important. But that is when the Holy Spirit is in us, active and alive. That's when the Holy Spirit is able to work with us. And I mean, and that's always a tough one because my biggest complaint about myself is when I'm talking with people is, could you just shut up and listen? Just shut up and listen because I talk too much. And so it's like I have to get in tune with the Holy Spirit. Say, okay, what should I be doing right now? I usually don't have to ask that question. Um, <laughs> listen a little more. But then you really know, because once you're listening, you can see past the question to the real question. To the real issue. I am really enjoying reading the Gospels and seeing how many times Jesus answers a different question than was asked. And I'm like, wow, that is fascinating that he's answering differently or he's not being as direct. It's almost like, well, I'm like, you could have just said this. And he's just, no, no, I'm going to say this over here. And how it gets the, gets the person to think and ponder. I'm like, that is so brilliant. And it's like he knows what to say and what not to say, when to say it. And Jesus is like, yeah. And I told you you can be just like me, and I gave you the Holy Spirit in you so you can do this exact same thing. Like, man, he is just looking to work in us and through us, and it's just such a blessing. And so the question is, is are we listening or are we dormant? Are we just letting, are we dormant, not really listening, just doing whatever? It is actually fascinating how many times our lives are a mess. And the question usually is, how much have you spent listening to the Holy Spirit? Then in God's Word, let, his, let the Holy Spirit speak through the Scriptures to us. Because a lot of times, the mess is because we haven't done that. We keep trying to figure things out on ourselves. And you, you, you I know the Trinity have a sense of humor. I, I, I know it to the core of my being because it's like, oh, I can't believe this isn't working out. And the Holy Spirit said, oh, really? Well, at some point you can ask me and I can help you or 
you can just keep trying to figure this stuff out and be a train wreck and ask yourself, I can't believe this is happening. And the Holy Spirit, like, I can. I know exactly why this is happening, and you can talk to me. And so he's got to have a sense of humor, or he just basically walked away and said, these humans are a waste of my time. But he doesn't because he loves us. He's like, when he says he'll ask, and I'll be there. And I was telling Chris, and I, I said, I had this very strange dream last night where I was sitting with Jesus, and he didn't look like the Jesus in all the pictures. Matter of fact, I don't think he had a beard. I think that's what threw me. And he says, you can ask me anything you want. And I asked him a question I would never ask him. If I, if I could sit before him, I could only ask him once, and he was there physically, and he would give me a response. This is not one of the questions I would ask. And he said, I'm like, I'm like, that's so stupid. Why are you even asking this? It was like, okay, when we pray for healing, should we really pray if it's just a cold, like when they have cancer? I mean, cancer is more you know, important. I mean, should we pray for healing from a cold? And Jesus said to me, break it down to the atom or the cell level. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, break it down. I'm like, okay. So we break it down. He said, something happens to our cells that causes a response to our illness. He said, well, all you have to do is stop it at the beginning part and everything's okay. But it always starts with one little thing that affects the cell, then it affects the body. So if you're going to have something that affects the cell, you want to stop that, right? I'm like, yeah. And then I'm like, oh, oh, in our life, <laughs> we have things that are going to affect us. And if we can stop it before it invades the cell, not just health-wise, anything, God's like, that's when you want to stop it. We like to pray once it's made us sick. And it's like, but we can stop it before it gets to that point. Is it, you know, like, I'm thinking, so you're not just talking about sickness here. You're <laughs> talking more. And it's like, yes. And so you bring everything to me to see if we can take care of it before it gets really bad. And I left you this thing called the Holy Spirit <laughs> who gives you the wisdom you need to walk the way you need to walk so you can stay as healthy as possible with me. All these issues we'll face we can actually cut it off before it invades the body and causes more damage. I'm like, oh, yeah. I said, so you took a bad question and you really needed a better answer. That's good. Uh, no wonder you never answer our, a lot of times our questions the way we ask. You have such a more insight. But it was just, I just woke up just troubled by it, and I told Kristen about it, and she's talking. And then I went on my bike ride, and I was able to remember more and more of the dream and the discussion. And it, I'm like, that is really cool. I said, you're tying this whole Holy Spirit into every aspect of our life. It's a rate of listen. And that's all we have to do is listen and obey, and we'll be fine. So if we can get the Holy Spirit working in us and through us, it will affect everything around us. We weren't made to be ineffective. We are the salt of the earth. And we can make a difference in this world with our neighbors and with our families and with our friends and those we just run into on a day-to-day -day basis. God will have a divine appointment. And sometimes he'll send us to different states and sometimes it's the person next door. That's all it is. So if we can be sensitive to it, we can help one another and we can grow and do amazing things for the Lord. And then we get to see like at times and the impossible happen. And that's always a fun thing. So we can praise him for that. So learning to ignite the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's work in others. It starts great when we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And so we're blessed to have that. And Jesus gave us his table. And he brought us together to take of his table together. He started with his disciples. It was not Jesus alone. It was him with his disciples. Breaking bread and taking the cup with each other and teaching us to do what he has done. 
And in fact, in the whole Bible, there's really the, the uh, I remember my professor saying, there's two, really only two ordinances in the Bible we're called to do. Baptize and take the Lord's Supper. Those are two things where we're commanded to do, the church, is take the Lord's Supper. And he said, do what I've done. And so we, 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 we follow in Jesus' steps. It tells us that we bring our sins to him, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we take the bread, take up, remember that his body was broken for us and his blood was spilled for us. And that's why we're here at the table. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you talk to us. Uh, you, you talk through people, you talk through your word, you talk through circumstances, you'll talk through dreams. You, you, you talk to us. And you sent your Holy Spirit to reside in us, to guide us, to remind us that you love us. Lord, at this table, remember that we should be always be sensitive to the leading of your Spirit. To walk with us and to listen and, and respond. We thank you for that. We thank you for this table, for this bread, for this cup, for the suffering that you did for us. You love us so much, you died so we could live. We praise you for that. May we worship you as we take this bread and as we take this cup. In Jesus' name, amen.